Hello and welcome to another Earth Dragon Art video. Um, in today's video I thought I would share the full um, digital paintwork of the Orlov character I did a few years ago. Um, I have already released a speed art video of this particular uh, process uh, which I'll put a link in the card in the description both above below and at the end of the video as well. But um, just coming across this recently with the Frozen film, the next Frozen uh, number two coming out and obviously with it being Christmas, I thought it would be quite interesting to share with you um, a more steady paced version of me uh, uh, creating this, not creating this character, but redrawing this character, painting it up and I just share some thoughts and insights as to what I did when I was creating it. So if you do want, if you're somebody that enjoys watching the whole process, it is quite a long video obviously, um, then feel free to join and everything else. If you're someone that prefers the speed art, just go and click on the card, dive over there and, and enjoy the shortened version. Um, I have tried to keep the music down in terms of not putting too much Christmas music in, so hopefully uh, the music in the background won't be too distracting. And I'll make this as interesting and as insightful as I, as I can possibly make it. The first thing I just want to say about this particular, um, this particular video is that I was st still kind of learning, this was the early stage of me learning how to use Photoshop, um, all the different painting tools and everything else. And the second thing about that was that I didn't have a digital tablet at the time, so one thing I'm going to do in the future with this, uh, with this particular drawing is I want to re not redraw it necessarily, because I don't think I really want to redraw the same characters over again. I want to kind of do so a bit new, but what I would like to do is to go back and just re um, excuse me, what's the, word, what's the word I'm looking for here? Just wanted to go back and just re edit it somewhat to make you know, just to sharpen up the character a bit more, make it a little bit more nicer looking. Because although I was happy with the end results at the time, I do feel looking back on it, I do feel like there's things that weren't quite right with it, things that I do feel I need to work on. So would be would be like to uh, revisit this at some stage, probably not this year. We'll see, and repaint it, just readjust things, and even take off the lines as well. Because I think, if I remember rightly, all the line work is still in this. So um, yeah, so I'm just going to go through some of the process of, that are doing uh, of this drawing, and uh, yeah, so I hope you enjoy this video, and um, I'll try and give you as much info as I can. All right, let's get to it. Okay, like with any video, or sorry, with any drawing, uh, one of the first things you always need to do is go for reference. If, if it's something you've drawn a million and one times before, reference isn't really an issue, isn't really something you need to worry too much about because you've done it 50 million times, you, you know what the character is, and you don't need someone to keep referencing each time. For example, um, you know, a character I drew quite a lot was Garfield, and I got to a point where I could draw Garfield blind, not blindfold, but without too much uh, reference material because I already had that design and, and character in my head. But with all of, although I had a visual representation from the movie and everything else, you know, to actually draw him specifically um, in accordance with the movie style of the character, I still need to get the reference so that you can get the accurate uh, looking, get, to get him looking like the character he's supposed to be. Because I could have just drawn a snowman and said, oh, that's all off. But the thing about any kind of um, artwork, particularly characters that are like set like this guy, he has a distinctive look. And the purpose being is that whenever you look at, say, this character, all off, regardless of who's drawn it or what environment it's in or whether they mess around, say, for example, they put him in a, you know, in a ski slope on a pair of skis or they put him in a coffee shop having a having a brew, you can instantly recognise that this is that character. Because if I was to draw a snowman with a carrot and everything else, you wouldn't necessarily think that that's all of. Just because it's a snowman, it's got the same elements to it, doesn't distinctly mean it's him. Every character is drawn in such a way that you can recognise that character every single time you do it as being this character. So as I say, in this case you've got all of. But if you look at another movie, you've got Jack Frost, which was a snowman as well. But that, but you can again recognise that that is Jack Frost snowman, not Olaf. If you get my what I'm saying. 
probably a, a bigger example is in Mickey Mouse, for example. Take Mickey Mouse, for example. You know, everybody knows Mickey Mouse is a big smile, big circle with massive ears, massive circular ears. So much to the point where a lot of the time when they do logos of Mickey Mouse, they literally just do one big circle, two smaller circles in one colour, whatever, whether it's white, black, red, whatever. And you instantly know that that's Mickey Mouse. So it's really important to get reference so that you're making sure that any character you're drawing, you draw it accurately. Um, I've heard I've heard a lot of times, a lot of times, from other artists I've seen online, who talk about people who keep saying, oh, it's bad to use reference. I can draw stuff without a reference. It's, it's terrible to use a reference. Uh, and that's a lot of baloney, quite frankly. Um, and it's really bad advice to tell people that you can't use reference, it's wrong to use a reference. Every single artist that's ever lived in throughout history has had some form of reference. You know, you think about it, Da Vinci, Leonardo, Leonardo Da Vinci mother, uh, Picasso, Monet, all of these guys work with things around them. You know, Monet went to um, places where there was nice scenery fields and stuff like that, and he had, he painted things that he saw. Um, Leonardo da Vinci, for example, when he was creating all these different contraptions and such, you know, he was looking at birds to try and see, right, well, how, well, how do birds fly? Okay, and he come up with these ideas. You have to have reference. There, there is a, there has, and I haven't personally come across this, but it, it baffles me that there are people out there who are adamant that you, you know, you mustn't have it, you must, you must always just create it just from your memory and just from your mind. Now, there's nothing wrong with nothing inherently wrong with coming up with an idea on a concept or a drawing that's completely from random from your head but to say you don't need reference at all that is the most ridiculous and dangerous thing to say quite frankly because you have to start somewhere you know if you want to be creative and come up with new ideas and new concepts and everything else you need reference from other things that you can take and incorporate that into the picture secondly as i said with the Olaf character if I try to, try to draw this guy without looking at a picture of him and working out, okay, what kind of shape of head has he got? What type of body does he have? How is his arms? What, what, does he have a carrot for a nose? Does he wear a scarf? Does he not wear a scarf? I would have created a character that people wouldn't recognise as being him because I'm not using the reference of what he is. <coughs> now, if I was to go away now, now that I've drawn him a few, you know, drawn him and everything else, I could probably draw him without looking at him too much, but I would still probably have to re reference him a little bit because I have only drawn him like once, once maybe twice, while I was doing this particular character. But I could probably draw all off without much guidance right now because I've already got the reference. I've already got him in my head. I know what sort of shape he is. He's got this very unusual kind of head because the head's the most distinctive part of this character. Because normally when you draw snowmen, for example, they're usually three dot, three big circles, the belly. The chest and the head but all off is kind of a not an egg shape exactly it's difficult to explain it, it I'm to think. his head's more like a butternut squash style head that that kind of shape you know that sort of squarish at the top but then it rounds it up at the bottom but it also comes out a bit as well but he has that specific type of head that you can only get that if you get the reference just drawing a random snowman would not portray that character so it's really important, first of all, to do that, especially if you're doing something more complex like Spider-Man or Batman or whatever. Although Batman, you could probably get away with drawing a Batman without reference because, you know, you just put ears, a cloak and a black suit. But even then, if you want to get an accurate, if you want to do Batman, say, from the Tim Burton's Batman, you have to know that you have to get the reference because that Batman, he has a yellow, yellow and black symbol. Whereas, I believe in the... Uh, Chris Nolan one, he doesn't doesn't have that, it's all black, completely black, there's no crest in the same way, it's not done in the same way, as far as I remember. I could be wrong, but I don't think he has that big yellow, yellow and black symbol on a chest. On his belt I think it's there, but not on the chest. And then if you want to do the 1960s Batman, again that's very different. Batman's got a blue cape, blue cape with a grey suit, a yellow belt. They're very different types of, types of you know, figures. So it's really, 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 really important to get reference. 
um, so you so you can uh, make sure that you're screen accurate. <clears throat> and as well as that, um, it's a way that you grow as a, as an artist. Because if you say, for example, I'm doing this character a little off here right now. Let's say in later on I decide I want to do a, a snowman of my own. I've got this this kind of character in mind. The fact he's different. <coughs> Excuse me, my throat's going to be dry. This character is very different. He's got a different shape and style to him. So, with that in mind, when I do my next snowman, I can take that thought of, okay, well, this snowman's got that kind of head. That snowman's got that kind of head. What kind of shape head should I do to differentiate from the other two and come up with a completely random and new idea? Without the reference prior to that of this character and previous snowmen, I can't, it doesn't inspire me or push me to think outside of the box and do something different. Uh, and, and that's really important to, to get. And it helps you grow and develop as, a, as an artist. Over the last sort of, you know, two, three years, one of the things I've been working on is my figure drawing, really just trying to uh, push the boat, I really figure out how to construct a, a more realistic looking human being. I'm still more geared towards cartoon characters, I'm not really looking at drawing realistic sketching artists of people. If I have, if someone wants that as a picture, I will do it and I'll, uh, you know, I'll give it my best shot with it, but I'm still pretty much geared more towards drawing cartoonish characters as opposed to, you know, comic book style characters as opposed to real life sketches and artwork and, and that's a t it's more of a preference it's not that I can't do it it's just my preference is more towards the comic book create you know cartoon style as opposed to say drawing a big sketch realistic sketch of a person's face a portrait or someone in a real real pose or a life drawing or whatever but what I have noticed is the more that I focused on on pushing myself by using reference to using different poses of different people and everything else I'm getting more comfortable <clears throat> more comfortable in drawing people and figure drawing but my space the space in my head can take other information and add details in that I wouldn't normally have included in a piece so for example let's say I've done some you know knight in shine armor type character and I'll do the usual breastplate and everything else you know sword or whatever but because I've, got, I've used reference to grow and get better at drawing said character, I'm adding details in the armour that I wouldn't have considered. For example, little clips showing where the armour's connecting to each different part of the, part of the armour. Perhaps putting a crest or a picture on it. Uh, maybe segmenting the armour a bit more. Adding a strap or a belt. But, but even then with the belt, adding all the little holes that you have in a belt and on the buckle just making the buckle thicker and um, adding extra sort of patterns or details difficult to explain in a voiceover video but hopefully as you see some of the other videos both the new ones I'm just releasing and some of the ones I'm going to you know the artwork I've been posting on my Instagram you can see there's been a bit of a development in terms of how much information I put in a particular piece I've always been a detailed person but the way the types of details I'm adding is very different now. I'm putting, I'm just filling it out more and making the characters feel more real and more um, real worldly, so to speak. Let me have a bit of a coffee. So I've got my little um, coffee with some hazelnut in it. Lovely. But, but going back to the whole reference thing, now here's the other thing with reference these people that are saying about reference the so first of all the people say you know that you shouldn't use reference they're probably I, I don't know but this is all speculation on this side of it but I suspect that they're probably just drawing the same old things each time and they're trying to be creative with that there's only so much creativity that you can have if you're just trying to get it from your head if you're trying to use your own memory and mind to come up with new ideas you're limited, you're actually limiting yourself by not looking at reference. You are actually hindering yourself because, you know, you might have, you might have some good ideas and from time to time you do have the odd idea that's completely out there. But in terms of your ability and your skill and, and even some of your concepting, 
without some form of reference, it's very difficult for you to really um, come up with something new and different than what you've done before. It's very, very difficult. I'm speaking from that from past experience. When I've tried to be creative or do something new before, I, I, get, I get a bit stuck. And I find that I'm doing, I am doing the same character. It is the same kind of art, it's kind of the same kind of style and whatever. But it's only when I've started to come out of the box and draw different things and different objects and even objects that I wouldn't normally do, normally draw. It has seemed to expand in my whole method and ideas in my head of how I can make this particular character or person or whatever far, far, far more interesting and more um, uh, inspiring to look at. So, so to say no, no reference, stop hindering yourself. If you're one of those people that do that, stop hindering yourself. Stop it. Now you may, you know, there are people out there that probably do have a bit more of a, hey, I can, I can just come up with things all automatically. It may, you know, I'm not saying there isn't. There might, there might actually be people that do have that kind of out, that absorption where you just see something and you absorb it and you, and you can put it into your pit. But every artist, every good artist will get reference. That, that's a fact. It's a plain, simple fact. So stop hindering yourself, go out there, find new ways. And I'll tell you what, try, if you don't believe me or you don't believe whoever else, try it for yourself. Try pushing yourself, try drawing something you haven't drawn. You know, try drawing a cartoon character you haven't drawn, or a superhero you haven't drawn, or an animal that you have never drawn before. Uh, and do that a few times and see what, go down the road, see what creativity comes up, see what difference uh, that you make with coming up with these new and inventive and ingenious ideas you'll be surprised and I think you'll realize very quick maybe not straight away but you'll think you'll realize long term that doing that doing that really will stretch yourself and really will bring out a new element to your artwork a new different vision a new different um, what's the one I'm looking for here it will it will help you grow as an artist. Now here's the rub. Again, when you say don't use reference, where if you don't know what something looks like, how are you going to draw it? For example, everybody knows what an apple looks like and people can probably draw an apple without reference. Now you might not get it screen accurate, so to speak. You might not realize all the different graining and all the different textures. But if you just simply draw one apple with the color, pretty much I'm pretty sure that everybody, whether you're a good artist or not, can draw an apple without having to look at a picture and go, wow, what's an apple look like? It looks like this. Okay, everybody can do that. But how do you know how to draw an apple if you've never seen it? Right? How do you know? Um, if I was to ask you, for example, can you draw a butternut squash? If you, for those that have seen one, could probably yeah go yeah I could draw it, no problem. But if you don't know what butternut squash fruit looks like, how are you going to know to draw it? Say I ask you right, well I want you to draw an orange and a tangerine and a satsuma. You could say, well, they all look the same, and they do look the same. But how would you differentiate without reference? You could draw a circle, but everybody's going to go, that's an orange. How are they going to know that that's a satsuma, or that's an orange, without reference? Uh, I'm trying to think of another example. Let's say another example. So let's say you're asking somebody that's a millennial today, I want you to draw me a picture of um, Charlie Chaplin. They've never seen Charlie Chaplin. They'd have no clue who Charlie Chaplin is. How can they draw that without going back and going, okay, who's Charlie Chaplin? Let's say I ask you, right, I want you to draw a supercar. Jim, Jer Jerry Anderson's supercar. That's a 19, well, I don't know what year it was, but that's a black and white TV series. How are you gonna draw that if you haven't got the reference? If you don't know what it's like? We can draw things that we've seen. 
and when you think about something you've seen for example like i say with the apple everybody's seen an apple you know what an apple looks like we can draw it blindfold because we know what an apple looks like because we've seen it so many times reference is all, all reference is is taking some is uh, taking in knowledge of, a, of an object or a subject or a character it's un knowing how what that character looks like what shape they are what, or the object what shape they are what colors they are and get an idea of how to draw it that's all a reference is there is nothing wrong nothing wrong with looking at a reference and going okay so that's what that looks like and that's what it is and once you've got it and once you've probably drawn it a few times you won't even need the reference then you'll be doing it from your head but the thing is your reference you're still even but even when you're drawing something without it in front of you if you haven't got the picture right there in front of you that you're that you're drawing you are still referencing you're referencing from your memory from something you've seen you know you could draw a horse now again regardless of how good you are at drawing you could anyone can draw a horse and people can go that's a horse because you know roughly what it looks like we know that horses have a mane we know horses have a tail they're four legs they've got this long nose whether you get it accurate or not that's by the by but you can draw a horse and most people should be able to go that's a horse regardless of your skill level but if you want to do the horse accurately and well and get the details right you need the reference to do it now if you if you're nice at straws horses all the time and you've you've practiced it you've you've drawn it in many different ways before you could probably draw the horse blindfold you know i could draw dogs without too much reference but if i really want to draw a dog right and i want to do a different type of dog because there is more than one type of dog i would need some kind of reference to draw it and and personally i would love to be able to sit in a room with these people that claim that um they don't need a reference take their phones off so they've got and any form of internet so they've got no means of going on the internet just to do research and give them a list of things that i can guarantee they they don't know how to draw they've never heard of or seen or aware of and they would not be able to draw it so we have to guess maybe but for the most part they wouldn't be able to draw it because they haven't seen it and the point will be clear that you know you need the reference reference is a vital stage of any artwork if you want to be good if you want to be expert brilliant at your craft you need that reference you don't may not need it long you may just need it just to get the idea for example, if you're drawing Spider-Man, you just need to draw Spider-Man from the reference two or three times to get the idea of the poses, the suit, the uniform, whatever, whatever, whatever. But once you've got it in your head, once you've drawn Spider-Man three or four times, you can put the reference away and you can carry on. For example, um, uh, Jazz's uh, uh, game, the Rogue Star uh, uh, ship. I've drawn that a few times. I've done a few variations of that ship. Uh, for the competition and even recently as those of you who've watched any of our videos will know that I've done a recent redraw of it. Now I could probably draw it without thinking about without a reference right now because I've got it in my head and I've got that vision in my head so I could probably do that without any form of reference but if I didn't initially have the picture of that ship and so I say oh can you draw Rogue Star? My first question is what's Rogue Star? What is that? Is it a planet? Is it a uh, uh, a person? Is it an animal? Wouldn't, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't have the first clue what that was. But knowing that this Rotar is this ship that Jazz had made, this is what it looks like. I might not have the colours bang on. I might not have all the colour scheme on it. But I know that there's white in it. I know there's some red in it. I know it's got a kind of a pointy kind of a nose cone. It's got a framework like a you know, a scaffolding type framework around it. Um, about four thruster engines on the side and another four or eight inside facing upwards. And, and that's what I know of it. And that's without thinking about it. Deep, um, Deep Space Nine's uh, 
Defiant. I could draw Defiant without really looking too much. I might not have all the details in there, but I might need to get every single detail in it. But I will know, and I've drawn it enough times and remember enough from what I've seen to be able to come up and create that, that ship without too much effort, without too much work. And I very rarely, I might I say, I might need reference to certain parts of it, but I should be able to draw that without too much thought because I know the shape of what it looks like and how, how it feels. Uh, and I could draw it out in different formats, in different directions, and different angles. I could probably even blow it up and make it look like the different parts are coming apart on it because I know how the ship looks. But if I didn't initially have that drawing in front of me, I would have only had a vague idea of what it looks like and what all the different parts were. I know I rambled along a lot about the referencing, but I just thought, since I'm doing this character and where, where references are a really important part of this uh, particular piece, I just thought it was worth just really um, stressing that, especially with those, of, those out there that feel the reference is not important, who have this mindset of, that you have to have that, you have, you, you know, you're not a good artist if you have to reference. It's the complete opposite. If you're not referencing, then you're not a good artist, quite frankly, because you're not open. Well, first of all, it, it shows an arrogance. Uh, it, shows, it shows a sense of arrogance, of, of superiority. And there's no need for that. We're all, art, you know, if, if you are an artist, we're all artists. We're all gifted in our different skills. We've all got different uh, abilities and different styles. And we've all got our own flavors and things like that. But if you're a one trick pony and that's all you draw is horses and you don't need reference, well, of course you don't because you've drawn the horses a million and one times. Try if you've not, but if someone throws something and says, like, can you draw this and you can't do it, you're stuffed because you're too, your pride is not letting you um, learn how to draw a new skill. You know, I'd, the other piece of this was Elsa. I'm not very good at drawing women. I'm getting better, but I don't think I'm so very good at drawing women. And, and, I, and I need to draw Elsa and grow in that. I think it was an okay job, to me, to be fair. I think for my first time really doing it, especially as a Disney character, I thought I did a good job of it. And you'll see Elsa at the end of this video, I believe. Um, so you get an idea of what it looks like. But I would never have been able to draw Elsa if I didn't have the reference. And even now, I think I probably would need a bit of reference as well because she's got a very unique style and whatever. But I could probably draw her in a, to some level and to some degree without too much effort. People can go, oh, that's Elsa. But for me, but if I'm doing it accurate, if I'm doing it well, I need that initial reference to get her right because kids will recognise her. You know, particularly girls will recognise her straight away. And if she doesn't look like Elsa, they won't recognise it. They might kind of go, is that, and they'll question it, but they won't recognize it. So it's really, really, really vital. And if, if you're not referencing, then you're not that good an artist. You, you need to grow, is what I'm saying. I'm not saying you're, not, you're a bad artist in the sense that you can't draw anything. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, you're not a good artist in the sense of, a, a good, okay, let me make that so clear. A good artist will always want to grow and get better and develop and add to their skill. If you say to yourself, well, I don't need, it's bad using a reference because you don't, you know, you've got to come up with your own head. You're not allowing yourself to grow, that's my point. You're, you're hindering your growth. You're stopping yourself from growing and getting better and by, by not looking at reference for different things. And again, even today, you look at the people that, like Jim Lee, um, Todd McFarlane, Stan Lee, all these many, there's many, many artists out there, uh, famous or other, you know, famous or otherwise. Every single one of them has had to reference at some point. They have, whether it be that they've done life drawing, because that's referencing. You go to a life class and you learn how to draw the anatomy. That's drawing. You go to still life drawing, where you're drawing fruits and plants and trees and whatever. That's referencing. You know, you, you read a comic, even when you read a comic. You know, if you're reading Batman or Superman or Spider-Man, the very fact you're reading those things and you're looking at them, you're referencing. 
you may not be conscious of doing it, but you're referencing. You know, for the fact that you know, oh, say for example, you decide you want to draw Spider-Man. I want to draw Spider-Man. How do you even know about Spider-Man without seeing it? You can you only draw you can draw Spider-Man because you've seen it, you understand him, you've read him many times, you've seen him on the movies, you've got some some idea that there is this character called Spider-Man. If Spider-Man didn't exist and someone said, Oh, can you draw Spider-Man? No one would think to draw Spider-Man in this suit with the big eyes, the blue, the blue and the red, all the webbing on it. They might put webbing on him, but they're more likely will draw just a man who's a spider because they don't know who Spider-Man is. So it's really, really, really important to, to stop saying to, don't use reference. So if you're out there and you've been told, don't use reference, it's bad. Please, just be, be, be the bigger person and say, no, I need reference because that's how I grow. And you, you allow yourself to grow. You allow yourself to use the references, use the different guides that you're given, use the different talents that you've been you know, uh, provided with to grow your skill and get better at being creative, at being more um, inventive in your creativity. And you know what, the person that's saying, don't use reference, you, you, might, you may well supersede them. You may well supersede their skills. You know, in a few years time, if you, if you learn from other artists, learn from other droids, draw characters outside of your normal comfort zone, the chances are, chances are um, you'll supersede that other person because you'll see your art grow and change and develop yeah this wasn't meant to be a big rant but I just thought it was really important just to address that I know other artists have but um, I don't know if anyone on my channel has been has, has had that experience you know let me know have you had that experience where someone said don't do it you know it was said to you don't use reference don't do it you know, let me know because it'd be interesting to see how many people get told this because if because I've only heard this from I've only heard this as a you know from uh, the hand of other artists who've been told that but um, but it'd be interesting to know from people that have genuinely had that where someone has said to him don't don't do it um, I was gonna say something else as well actually about about that company I was gonna say now. Um, one second. Um, it's the only way to grow. It's the only, only way to grow. It's, it's, it's to get, it's, it's to learn from other pieces. So anyway, back to this um, video here. So right now, I'm just drawing rocks and things like that. Now, when I was doing this um, this particular piece, um, as I said, I didn't have a digital tablet at the time. Uh, this project was actually for a charity event. Uh, I was asked to make some pictures and uh, just to try and, you know, hope you drive uh, money to a charity. I'm not going to say which charity, I'm not going to um, go into that information, but um, for the purpose of this was just to try and, you know, get some money, you know, get some sponsorship to help uh, the charity uh, meet the needs of that particular event. And it's just some random drawings, there was only a few printed, it wasn't too many, it wasn't like a mass production thing, it was just a casual kind of hey let's let's choose somebody you know some characters that kids are gonna enjoy and, and whatever and it, it was good it was a good fun project and it was definitely something that I wouldn't normally have drawn I wouldn't normally have gone out of my way to draw an Olaf or indeed Elsa um, but I was asked initially to draw Spider-Man which you'll see in a previous video as well um, but on this occasion I thought it was you know as much as it was good to do Spider-Man I need to do for the girls as well for young girls so I did all off and Elsa so that at least that way there's a little bit more creativity a little bit more um, variety in terms of the characters that I'm drawing so that's got sort of what this project was all about um, but I said at the time um, all I had was one of the, the entry-level Wacom tablets which were, which are great they're great entry-level uh, tablets in fact it's actually a bamboo to be exact which I don't think they make bamboo ones anymore um, and it was definitely, definitely a, a, a learning curve in terms of just drawing, ha, ha, drawing on, a, on an electronic pad as opposed to drawing on a piece of paper and stuff like that. So it was a very new venture and a very new area for me to 
uh, to use any kind of creativity. And the thing about the, the drawing tablets, which are great, was that you had to look at the screen and your tablet was down by your hand. So you couldn't really, you see, you had to kind of look at the screen using, uh, and use your, your right hand or left hand, whatever it was, to draw the picture separate. So you're not physically seeing where your hand is, which is kind of a bit disconcerting in, in that sense. It's like trying to draw with your blindfold. You can't really see where your hands are as you're drawing, so you have to kind of guess a bit. So there's a lot of guesswork as to where I was uh, in these pieces and trying to figure out uh, where I'm where I'm drawing on the screen. It wasn't too bad. I mean, I got used to it. Uh, it wasn't too bad. But definitely having a digital tablet now makes a big, big difference. But but doing but if I was doing it by mouse, a mouse mat, forget it. I have tried to draw with a mouse mat and it's horrible. Never, ever do that. I mean, if it's your thing and you want to kind of, and you're very good at it, by all means go for it. But I wouldn't recommend it, you know. It, it, if you can get a digital tablet, if you can afford it, and you're really serious about drawing digitally, do it. But um, but, only, but only if you really want to want to do it. Don't do it just because it's a trend or whatever. Because it's an expense. You have to spend money to get that. And you don't want to spend that money to get it if you're not going to be serious about it. But, you know, to be honest, if you're someone that wants to, be, to draw casually, and you, but you want to draw digitally in a casual way, then definitely get a drawing tablet as opposed to a digital screen. Um, unless you, you know, unless you really, really want to. It is an investment, absolutely. And, you know, I'm not knocking getting the digital screen. It does definitely have its advantages, but if you're not, if you're just doing it for fun, a, di a drawing tablet is just as, just as good. But um, a digital tablet is just really, it's like having a piece of paper in front of you. Um, but as I say, just bearing in mind that they are more expensive so if you are going to do that, you want to make sure you're not just buying it just for the sake of it. You want to make sure that at least it's paying for itself in some way or form. But, you know, it's up to you. It's up to you, really. Um, but, yeah, so I was using a digital tablet here. Um, and I got used to it very, very quickly. And I was just really trying to learn different ways and different techniques of how to paint and create these different pieces of artwork. And you might notice here that some of the techniques I'm using... Um, are a little um, inefficient, for want of a better word. I still thought the the tech, the um, the ultimate effect was fine, but but they weren't very efficient ways of doing it. And it was just okay. I was just really learning, really, just trying to develop, learn my skill, learn how to create and craft these things in a way that looks good. Uh, put the colours in. And I think that for the most part, like these rocks, for example, I'm drawing right now, I think for the most part, I think they came across okay. I think that, uh, you know, I got that effect of them being, uh, you know, a piece of coal or whatever it was stuck on his, on his chest and stuff. They had the effect they needed to have. But, uh, but I think going forwards, I could probably do that better. When I do, when I do a reworking of this later on, I could probably do that a little bit better, put a bit more emphasis on it, a bit more effort into it to make them um, <clears throat> just stand out a lot more and just make them a bit different, a bit more... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, just trying to think now. Uh, I, I could probably just make them a little bit more rock... more, more realistic looking, you know, in, in a cartoony kind of way. The same with all our face, I can just... In, enhance his face and just make him look a bit more decent but um but yeah but it's, it's, it's just really learning really learning how to use a digital tablet and getting the effect right the other thing as well is i'm still fairly new with photoshop um, i'd only been using it a little while prior to this but not on a serious level just really just casual just taking my time on it and learning all the different softwares and programs and things like that and <laughs> Photoshop is a massive learning curve. If you've never used it before, um, I highly recommend finding a tutorial or something in the tutorial. Take, you know, be, take the humble bullet, do a tutorial, and then you learn the basics. Once you've learned the basics, you can start to learn some of the other things. 
uh, but don't just jump into Photoshop and expect to just, you know, pick it up and run with it. It's not like PowerPoint or Word where you can just pick it up and just go. Um, with Photoshop, you really need to know what you're doing to start with. You really need to know what the tools are, what the basic tools are, especially layers. That's why you're one of the the um, the, the most layers and masks one of the most difficult things to understand and learn when you're using Photoshop and how that all works. Um, one tool was another thing that, that baffled me and I couldn't, it used to frustrate me uh, when I first used it because I we tried to put a mask on, you know, to um, uh, lasso something, you know, highlight a particular area, but it wasn't picking up all the different areas. It was little gaps where it was picking up parts of the building behind and I wasn't getting a clean selection and then as I click off it the selection all the effort I've done trying to select everything is gone I used to get so frustrated I mean I still get frustrated with Photoshop it's still not the easiest program to work with but over time I've got more and more comfortable with using it and understand more what it does and sometimes it doesn't always do what it's, it's supposed to do from time to time it does glitch out a bit and doesn't always work 100% but if you've never used Photoshop in your life before, uh, don't expect it to suddenly pick it up. You might be one of those people who pick things up very quickly, that's fine. But um, don't assume you will pick it up straight away. You, you always need some kind of guidance. Even if it's just basic, right, this is what that does, this is what that does. And then you can run with it. But once you've got it, once you understand it, checking layers, that's when you can really learn how to uh, build build your skills um, for example in point um, you might notice that as I'm painting this nothing's getting painted on the black lines you know I've got some white colors and gray colors and everything else but as I'm painting it the the, um, the, white, the white areas is not going over the black lines and that's because of a thing called masks and layers and what's basically happening is the top layer there's a, there's, there's a layer underneath the top layer where, where the line work is, where the rock is drawn. Underneath there's another layer and I'm painting on that. So I'm painting underneath the black lines. If you think of it like this, say you're, you know when you do a tracing, when you've got your piece of tracing paper on top of your picture and you've drawn up the character or what object that you've got underneath it. Imagine that tracing paper still being there, but you're actually colouring the paper underneath it. That's basically what, what layers are. You're colouring what's underneath, what's on top, if that makes sense. Again, it's difficult to explain verbally uh, without showing you in, in specifically, but that's basically what a layer is. And it's a really, really handy thing to learn as a first, um, as a first part of any kind of artwork. You can learn about the wand, wand tools and the selection tools and all that. But if you understand layers first, it doesn't. It's not so important to learn about the magic wand because you can just, for example, these rocks. I could just simply draw the shape of the rock underneath it, color it, fill that in, and then paint that second part with all the different details using the lines as a reference. That's the rough gauge of where they all where they all go. But um, layers was one of the, definitely one of the things that it took a little while to kind of really understand and grasp. Um, as I said, the one tool, or the lasso tool more specifically, was the next one I really, really struggled with. It's a great tool, both of those are great tools, and they have a massive advantage, but one thing I found, particularly when I'm drawing like characters like this, although I made the lines as clean as I could, there's oftentimes there's little blemishes in that drawing where it still had some of the pencil line work that wasn't visible on screen, but the computer, pick, the computer picked up that there's all these different colour variations in the paper. So for example, if I was to select the whole middle of the body, it would select the whole body, but there'd be areas where the, the, what, the selection wouldn't select it all. There'd be little dots. So if I was to colour it in, there'd be dots, bits missing in the colouring of the actual character. Um, which was, I found very frustrating. And when I was learn initially learning how to uh, do layer masks or use the lasso tool, 
I had to have magnetic everything else. As soon as I clicked off it and and accidentally hit another button, that whole effort I made to select that item was gone. And I had to reselect the whole thing again. And I did this over and over. But over time I've learned how to how to get around that. Um, <clears throat> Um, one of the ways I was doing that was when I when you're selecting an, an area if whether you use the magic wand tool where you just click on it once and it selects everything and it doesn't select all of it so my half the arm is not selected if you press the plus the I think it was the alt button uh, sorry the uh, the shift button and hold while using the wand the lasso tool you can select the other rest of the arm and just draw around it and it will add to that selection I didn't know that at the time. Um, so that was one major frustration that I had where we kept doing that. It used to drive me crazy. So I was trying to learn how to do masks. I, I put a, remove a background I don't want to put back where I do want any. And it wasn't allowing me to do that. But now I've got to the point where I can do that a lot more comfortably because I know how to add or remove lines. So again, let's say again, I was using the magic one to select say the body but some of the arm was selected by mistake. Using that same method, but this time with the alt button, you can deselect certain aspects of it so that you're only ever selected that one piece of the picture. In a later video, I'll probably show you what, what I mean by that. Um, but for now, obviously this is just a drawing this character here. But, that, but that, that was another, that was, you know, definitely a bit of a frustration. Um, but one of the biggest frustrations I had, and this was something that for, for months, months it's happened and it used to drive me insane. And no one, none of the tutorials ever talked about this, which I find crazy. It was such a simple thing, but not a single person who ever did a tutorial at that time pointed this out. And I couldn't figure out. And that is the, the, um, the caps lock button. Uh, let me take another sip of coffee and I'll explain what I mean. Now you see on this picture here, as I'm painting, whether I'm painting, whatever brush I'm using, you'll notice that the brush, the shape of the brush is very clearly visible on screen. So it could be a circle, it could be a little, as you can see here, um, a rough squiggly line shape or whatever or the eraser tool, or all the different tools are clearly visible. But there was numerous times when I had a crosshair. And I don't know if you know what a crosshair is. Basically a crosshair is, when you have a sight, like a, a gun sight, you have this line, line, vertical line going up and down with a line across it. So it's like a big cross in the middle. Trying to paint a line with just a cross, little cross symbol, not knowing what size brush you have so you can have a massive brush a tiny brush you had no way of telling what size brush it was it was an absolute nightmare and this would happen for ages and oftentimes i was doing one of the um, jazz competitions the draw the jazz competitions uh, and and i had to be very very and the time was getting short and short and short and i had to be quite accurate of where i was drawing or where i was painting I think you'll probably see it in some of the, you know, some of the competition piece videos that I've done. And I couldn't see what I was drawing and it was just so frustrating because I'd draw a line, realise that the brush was too big, try to shrink it, and I had no way of telling how big or small that brush was. It turned out that when you have the cap slot button on, you get the crosshair on a brush. So when you're using, so when you're using a brush and, you use, and you've got the crosshair, the caps lock on, you've got a crosshair. To get rid of it, you press the caps lock off and you get your brush again. And for months I didn't know this and I just happened to randomly find out. I can't remember exactly what it was, I did one thing, I was like, oh, is that what it is? And it was a, it was a game changer for me. <laughs> so now now I'm kind of, you know, if I've got a crosshair and I can't see it out, I know now what why I was getting the crosshair. And I just thought, and the reason it took me two months to realise is I thought it was the kit, the computer glitching out. I thought it was my PC being slow, or you know the software glitching out and not doing what it needed to do. And I, 
I just thought it was a, a software glitch ultimately. And I had no idea that it was just something as simple as that. Um, so, the one thing I would say whenever you're doing any kind of piece of work is try to remember what the code, what it is you've done. You know, if, if you press a key and something changes, try to remember what that key was you changed so that you could go back to it and, and learn how to undo what you've just done in terms of the, uh, the, key, the keystrokes or whatever. Um, there's been times when that's happened, I've accidentally hit a key, shift or shift and this key, it's done this and I don't know what I did. Uh, and then I'm frustra getting frustrated. So if you're ever doing an action, or if you see any of these videos where they say, right, click this and this to do this, just remember to turn that back off is to do the same in reverse. So for example, Command H, I think it is, hides any selection boxes that you have. To get them back, you press Control, Command, Control H again to get it back, or Control D to deselect everything. But you need to know these little tricks and whatever to revert back a function before you move to the next function. But yeah, but that was definitely a big, big, big frustration. When I realised, I was like, oh, I couldn't believe it. When I realised that was what was going on, I really couldn't believe it. Like, really? It was that simple. And I only wish that um, I'd known that and learnt that at the time. Now the other thing with tutorials, and this is something again I, I, I found out, this is the one tool I was talking about, this bit here was the one tool. And you notice I'm expanding and making it a larger area so I'm capturing all the different elements, but that's the one tool. You see it's, it picked up, in this instance it picked up everything, but in some cases it might pick up part of the eye, depending on what layer you're on. <clears throat> anyway. Um, one thing I've also noticed about tutorials is there's been a numerous, numerous occasions where um, they've actually missed a step. So the video, they've made this video, they've, they've taught you how to do this, and there's one key step that they miss in the video, and they don't realise they've done it. Now, now fair to, in fairness to them, they probably just did it and didn't realise they'd missed it. Um, but that was another frustration. That I really had to went had to go through where you're trying to follow this tutorial stage by stage by stage and this one vital step that they missed and you're like well, it's not working and your project you're doing what you're trying to copy isn't working because they've missed that step now thankfully on a few of those uh, because I've at that point I'd gained a bit of um, understanding of the software and what it was I would I knew what the step it was that they missed so I was able to go in there and say and, and adjust that picture to match what they were doing. But if someone's doing a tutorial, you need to tell every stage, every single stage, so that people understand what you're doing, where you're going. And and anyone that is a tutorial maker, just be mindful that if you're teaching a function, if you're saying, yeah, do this, do this, do this. Just remember to tell people to turn it off, do this. If you find you're doing this and that function is still there, that is still doing the same thing as your previous function, turn that off. This is how you do it, boom. So that people are not getting frustrated. Photoshop is a great program, but it can be very, very frustrating if you've never used it before. Uh, and there's still so much I need to learn over the program. There's still things that I want to learn. There's still aspects that I'm not quite familiar with tricks and tra tricks that could potentially help me as well to get faster and better and I haven't had the time to learn it but these there are definitely things I can learn more and you know this I want I would like to do some kind of tutorials just to help the people like me who had that frustration with this program who didn't understand X Y and Z and go right okay if this happens do this and little tricks like that um, there's even a function I found out recently called um, grayscale, so that you can even set it so that you can have a grayscale screen, but not affect the actual artwork. So you can just temporarily turn it on and turn it off, and you have grayscale. So that if you want to kind of make sure that the colours you're putting in will show if someone was printed up in black and white, for example, that it works, you know how to do that, and you can carry on painting in black and white, but in actuality the picture is still the colour that you're using 
really handy little tool. So maybe one day I'll show you how to do that. But um, yeah, I, I hope you find this informative. I know this is a bit of a, a bit of a rant and a bit of a waffle today. Um, yeah, you know, it's a lot. It is a long video. I appreciate that it's a long video, and I'm trying to give you as much um, insights or whatever to my process, particularly with this character, as possible. So I do hope you, you're finding it. And if you are finding it, it you know, is, you're learning something. Let me know what you've learned. Let me know what you've learned from this, from what I've said or whatever, your thoughts or whatever. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to hear what people have to say. But um, one thing I will say is that if you do comment, do be constructive. You know, even if you're making a point out something that maybe I've done wrong or said wrong or whatever, just be constructive, just be courteous. You know, I'm still a human being, still have, <laughs> I still have feelings and stuff like that. So just be courteous. I know it's the internet, but it's not an excuse to be, you know, mean-spirited. You know, we're all trying to grow, I'm trying to grow. Anyone that's watching this hopefully is trying to grow as well and trying to enjoy the process. Let's try and make, you know, build a better communi community around us. Um, so just be very constructive with your, your points. Um, in terms of just really, you know, my creativity and stuff like that, I am still learning, I'm still growing. Um, I kind of, and I am aware of what areas I need to work on. And this, say so this piece was, bearing in mind this piece was done three or four years ago now. And if I was to do this again today, it'd be very very different my Olaf would be a very different looking character and for one thing I wouldn't be doing um, a pose that's recognizable I would try to do something a bit more creative with him you know I'd have him you know maybe skiing down a slope or something something different and unique I wouldn't be quite so static I only chose this particular version because um, as I said it was for a charity event I didn't want to I didn't have a lot of time to do it uh, and I wanted to do something really quick, easy, but instantly recognisable, and would hopefully bring up some attention to the charity and you know in, involved. Um, but if I was to do this again, I'd be a lot more creative, and I'd be a lot more accurate as well in terms of how to draw him. So I'm not looking to at this stage anyway uh, for input on how I can improve or whatever. These things I'm aware of, and I'm working towards those things. Once I reach a level where I feel like, okay, I've reached, I've, I've, I've overcome these hurdles that I know already that I need to overcome, now I need to take it to the next level, then obviously I will open myself up to saying, hey, give me some insight and input. At the moment, I'm not at that point yet because I kind of know where I need to grow at the moment. But anyway, with this character, one of the things that um, I learned in terms of just um, uh, painting this guy's, just really learn about the blur tool. Um, um, with um, initially, I used to use um, Jazz's uh, brushes, the blender brush and stuff like that, uh, and use the technique that he was showing. Um, but the one thing I found with that technique, and there's nothing wrong with that technique at all, but the one thing I found with it is was I just found I, kept, I was constantly just redrawing that area, redrawing that paint, over it, painting that same area the same way over and over and over and over again and not really getting the, the, the smoothness and the uh, the feel that I was looking for and and that could be just a, you know me that I just need to grow my painting skills I don't know but I wasn't getting the feel and the, the essence of the character that I was trying to achieve but I found that if I get the, all the shading if it's in the right place I can put in a blur tool which will automatically blend it together and then I just adjust it to the right level so that it, so that it feels more rounded and more um, more crafted and it works, works, works much better. And I, even here with the carrots, with the grooves in the carrots, over time I learned that if I, that, that uh, immediate light, light shine on the carrot gave that that sense of it was there was a slit there's like a slit inside the actual edge of that character and it really helped bring that that feeling of a real carrot on his nose it was just something a technique I started to learn over time and if you look at the um, the Captain America video uh, with the shield and everything else hopefully you'll see that you'll see how in that particular video how 
using this technique really worked well for the battle damage of the shield and to try and give that real sense of their grooves in this where, where the shield's been scratched and dug into with a weapon and it's got that strong feel um, that, that strong feel of battle damage on that shield you, again you'll see if you watch that video you'll, you'll see it it's on the Harkus Maximus video I can't remember if I did it separately the shield I think I did but if I didn't I will maybe do that separately maybe in the new year I'll do a separate one just for that and segment each different one I'm pretty sure I did do a, a separate video for each one but you would have to go through my video selection playlist to see if that's been the case but you can see how in this picture here with the carrot that the you know it feels like a carrot it feels like a solid carrot carrot there's there's enough texture in there at this stage anyway to give that sense of what it is um if i was to do it today again i think i'd be a bit more specific a bit you know i put more effort into it i probably put a lot more grooves in it to make it um um to make it a lot more um uh detailed or whatever I'll make it a bit more realistic looking so yeah so it's just something you know just something I'm learning just something I'm growing with just something I'm developing you know it, it, it's a learning it's a learning curve all these things is a learning curve and again it reverts back to what I said about referencing and stuff like that is you've got to try different things you've got to try and use different techniques and different styles and different take different aspects from different projects to bring it into a piece um, I'll give you an example um, a little while ago and I can't remember if I recorded it or not but there was a competition a few years ago called New Resolutions I honestly don't remember if I recorded the video for it or not I don't think I did uh, where we had to draw a computer game screen and re-update it to a you know a 4k kind of current digital stage of everything um, and one of the pieces in this I actually used um, a, a cooking tray you know where you've had where you've had cooked potatoes and things like that using that as a texture for the planet to help give a sense that 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 planet is a lava filled planet and it makes a difference you wouldn't know that that's been used for that it's not obvious that it's a cooking plate but that's what i use for reference i use that to just build that piece up and make it the sun or the the lava planet feel really giving all the different cracks and uh, and different elements if i use it for two different projects actually um, i use it for the um uh, the rogue star planet as well um just to give that texturizing aspect of that piece to make it look amazing and to make it look realistic and that's kind of a reference in the way itself because I'm using something that you wouldn't have thought about to get the text that you need so you've got to kind of always push the boat out and get better and even looking at this when when I look at some of these pieces like this one sometimes I have to catch myself because I look at it thinking oh I should have done this I should have done that I should have drawn that I could have done that better I should have put the shading on that side not that side you know, I'm self-critical, so so even, you can even take reference from the old old work. It's, right, there's a there's a thought for you. Um, you know, look at this and think I could have done that better. I could have done that. You know, like for example, this one here. I think the shadow should have been the other side of the face, underneath the nose, not above the nose. But I look at these things and go, well, I could have done that better. And maybe next time I approach this, I will go a different direction, and I'll go do it this way rather than I'll do it that way. But yeah, but that's just got me thinking. Um, the thing about referencing is you can actually reference your own work as well. Um, if you've been following me at all, whether it be on Instagram or on fake YouTube or whatever, you'll know that I've been doing a lot of redrawings recently uh, over the last year, uh, re redrawings of old, old artwork and showing, kind of updating them, putting new elements on it putting new skills that I've learned over the years into those pieces but that is a form of referencing because you're referencing your old piece to come up with a new piece 
to look at what you've done and look at, right, well, how can I improve on that? That's, which is another important part of referencing, is you're trying to come up with a new idea. Um, look at this way, right? It, take a Ferrari, okay? So pe Ferraris have been drawn for years. Ferraris have been going around for years. When they come up with a new Ferrari, they don't just go, right, let's come up with a new car idea and just draw a car idea. They look at how Ferrari looks. They look at the previous Ferrari and maybe the previous few Ferraris prior to that. And they think, oh, right, okay, this is, this is how the feel of this car. This is how the car feels, this car looks. So how can we come up with a new concept that still feels like a Ferrari, that is new and different, but people know that this is a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or whatever. And they will use the previous design and then readapt and change and make adjustments to it. Maybe even reconcept and hold the whole style, but again using the previous versions of that particular style of car to come up with something that is new and innovative. If look, I've got word, innovative, but still has enough elements of the original that people go, oh, that's a Ferrari, or that's from the Ferrari company. This is from this brand. Think about that. Think about that. Referencing old pieces that you've done before is really, really important. And especially as you're growing and you're changing, you can look at an old piece and go, oh, that's, I'm really not happy with that. And it might be a piece that you've forgotten about. You were never happy with it the first time round. But when you see it thinking, you know what? I've grown since that. I can redo that. And I think I want to redraw that and make that better than it is now. But you can use that to do a better version of that piece but you can reference your own work. You're referencing what you've done before and you're using that as a stepping stone to improving on that. And then in a few years time, you can do this whole process again. Go back to that piece and go, actually that piece is really good, that new version. Can I up it? Can I, can I do it even better than that? Now, and it's a good, and it's a good way of really inspiring you. It's one that I think, I think I've found. It's a good way of inspiring you to get better because you look at your old piece you look at what your style is now you redraw it and then you compare the two you go wow what a change I used to be like this and now I'm like this that's amazing and then when you put it to one side and you do a third version and you compare that to the previous one and the previous one before that you can get really inspired thinking wow I've really changed I'm, I'm getting good and it and I tell you something for me personally it really motivates me to keep going because I'm seeing every drawing I do now I'm not looking at well that's not good enough oh I can't quite get this or I can't quite do this well every drawing I'm doing now I'm looking at well I know I can do that better if I was to do this again I can do a better version of that and there's a sense of I can improve on this piece because I've grown and I've learned. I've learned new techniques, I've learned new uh, ways of drawing it, I've got more, um, I've absorbed more different um, objects and ideas of textures and things like that, how, what I can incorporate in this to make this piece better than these other versions. And every time you do that, you, you, you're looking, you, you're inspiring yourself to get better and push yourself and and do a better job the next time around and that's something that I hadn't considered before and it's really important to kind of use your own referencing to see where you've got where you were and where you've come from because I look at some of my old pieces particularly these Jezza competitions like my Grimatol for example my first Grimatol looking back was so bad um, it was so so bad I was never I mean I'll be honest I was never really fully happy with it uh, when I when I entered it, it was my first ever competition I entered for. Um, in these competitions, it was the first challenge of the month I ever did. I mean, I was happy with it, but when I saw some of the entries and what people come up with, I was like, "Wow, mine's just rubbish." But I but I never fully realised the version I had in my head of what this character was like. For starters, the background didn't go the way I wanted. It didn't feel the way I wanted, and the actual Grimador character was just 
so poorly drawn. Uh, the anatomy was completely wrong and off. Um, uh, the, the, the male and female characters, again, the anatomy was so off and bad. I like the texture and the way um, I made them look like they were being absorbed was fine. But the actual, um, the actual concept, the actual piece, I really despised it. I was so unhappy with the final results of my Grimator that I've drawn, even since then, I've drawn it numerous times over and over and over again. And today, and I'll share this at a later stage, today, in fact, I've actually posted it on my Instagram, um, I've done a version of it that I'm actually satisfied with. I am severely happy with the concept that I've done of this guy and I'm looking forward to painting it, which I'll be able to record this time, which before I didn't. Um, record the process and, and, and color this guy in. But the version I've done now, which is version number 11, I think, uh, which just shows you how many times I've drawn this guy to, to get to a point where I'm like, I'm really happy with it. The version I've done now, I'm so inspired by it. And when I look back at what I did before, it really was awful. It was absolutely terrible. The idea was fine. It was the idea wasn't, you know, I like the idea of the character. I like the concept of the character. But the way it looked, the way it felt, the way it, way it came across, you know, the the end results of what I, was not what I had in my head. It just didn't have that feel that I was looking for. But by referencing that version and all the other versions since then that have adapted each time, the version I have now, which again you can see on my Instagram page, Earth Dragon Art, um, shameless plug, uh, the version I have now, I'm so much more happy with it. And also the male and female characters as well. The versions I've done for those, although there might still be areas of improvement, I, I, I get that, but the versions of those characters. Again, it's so much better. And once I go into painting it and recreating the whole scene in the way that I really, really wanted, it's gonna make a difference. It's going to make a difference. But to be fair to myself, I was, I was in a learning stage. It, you know, I, <laughs> I'll, I'll explain in a minute in a second. I, I was still learning and growing and developing I was learning how to use Photoshop, I was learning how to use Illustrator, programs I'd not used before. I was using a digital tablet, not a, not, sorry, a, a, a drawing tablet, not a digital tablet. So I had that challenge ahead of me. So I wasn't drawing specifically onto a piece of paper, so to speak. Um, there were so many elements that weren't there and I didn't understand. And certainly my backgrounds, drawing backgrounds was not a skill that I had. I still don't think I'm very good at doing backgrounds myself personally but I am improving and that's the important thing is I'm improving. Um, let me just have a bit more coffee. It was something I was going to say, but I can't remember what I was going to say now. One second. <clears throat> We're on the final hurdle of this video, so this is good. Okay, but yeah, um, but the thing about um, because it's, my backgrounds were just really stale and they were very stagnant. They were very kind of uh, flat. There was no emphasis, no depth to them. There was no um, detail to the background. And the thing is, I didn't, I think it comes boils down to not having reference. You know, it highlights the fact that if I have reference and draw things that I don't normally draw, I started to get more ideas of how I can create a background that works with the characters. And at the time, I was using, you know, reference from UK buildings and stuff like that, which was fine, but I didn't have the skills and the ability to come up with buildings that looked realistic and, and felt real worldly and had that sense of depth and detail that, that, that was needed to make this piece really stand out, especially against competition, because some of the competition was amazing. And that's not to say that my skill level, I couldn't win with my skill level, because it's just a case of getting the concept right and, and the execution done well. It doesn't have to be that same 
fully rendered detail that some other guys are able to do because you know if it's got the right elements that will stand out on its own but I didn't have the, the vision and um, I don't want to say a word of reference because that's I've used it with a lot understanding the building work to make the background look to stand out as much as the actual characters the characters ultimately do need to stand out the most but if the environment doesn't feel right it's very difficult to feel comfortable with the, the end result if I could do a fully rendered spider-man for example do a really good job of him and I put the background in and the buildings feel very flat so you go this nicely 3d spider-man spraying webs all over the place flying through the air but then the buildings look like cardboard boxes it would just look awful and that was kind of the feel that I had it was like it was like having cardboard cutouts on these characters although I wasn't happy with the Grimator the count the background felt like cardboard cutouts and it had no um, no depth but I didn't have enough understanding of of backgrounds and buildings to be able to make them look look and feel real or feel like they were part of the piece and that's where I needed the reference to kind of go in there learn a draw different buildings draw different windows draw different houses draw fields and whatever and even like drawing a, like drawing a pirate ship to some degree has helped me to regrow that and now when I look at backgrounds I'm a lot more mindful of the backgrounds that I'm putting in they feel a bit more grounded and a bit more and a little bit more elements and depth to them so it's really important again just to really emphasize how much reference is really important you know reference is your ally it's not it's not a hindrance the hindrance is trying to rely on your own mind to 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 create things using your own create your own creative mind to create things when you've only filled it with a certain amount of information for you to be creative for you to go beyond um, your creative insights and, and, and designs and ideas you have to fill your head with reference for many different things you know it could be you see a magazine you see a picture of a watch and there's a particular cog in the wheel that you saw I thought what's a nice picture you draw it down you get that idea in your head and later down the line when you're drawing a picture you're drawing a robot for example you go oh yeah there's that cog and whether you consciously or unconsciously subconsciously put it in there it's from you'll find it's from that that time that you saw that one piece that one item it's stuck in your head and it now becomes part of your pictures and it starts to become a staple part and you start seeing it more and then you add to that you, you, you then bend it a little so that cog that set cog shape that you've drawn you might change it from cogs to spikes you might double the spikes you might add a double cog or had add little holes inside the cog to make that cog look better do you know what I mean it's, you get the idea in your head and then you adapt it and that's where the reference really comes in a reference a reference isn't copying and I think that's where, where the problem is these guys that say ref don't use reference in their heads they're thinking it's copying you're copying something you're not copying anything I mean if you are copying something that's different you know if you're copying it to learn that's fine that's, to that's totally fine nothing wrong with that if you're copying for copying sake or you just want to put that other person's detail in your idea and say it's mine that's different but referencing is you're using that as a platform to think outside of the box to think creatively something different to think creatively of what to add in your piece because you don't have to draw it that way you know if you draw a triangle what you in, in a in a in an artwork that triangle doesn't have to stay a triangle that triangle can be cut in two halfway through and change it to a different shape and then you mess around with the shape you know you draw in a circle it doesn't have to stay a circle it could be that circle you just drawn you could split it in half and have two two half moons or you can cut a, you know put a smaller cut 
cut a semicircle out of it and make it into a, you know, like a sl slidey moon, whatever. <laughs> it's difficult to explain what I'm saying. The point I'm saying is, if you're drawing something from reference, what you're and you're putting that reference in your piece, that reference can change. It doesn't have to stay the shape it is. Whatever that reference is, you're drawing a car, you're drawing a Lamborghini, for example. You're drawing a Lamborghini, you want a Lamborghini in your space picture. Well, remove the wheels and put jets there. Put, or put make or take the wheels out and make it a hover car in the shape of a Lamborghini. Add something on the back of the Lamborghini to make it into a van. You know, take the front of the Lamborghini and put it in front of a motorbike. <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? It's like referencing is is your ally. It's not your enemy. Uh, and it's and you, if you use it right, it can really boost you and and improve on your on your ability to be more creative. You have to fill your mind to be creative, to be inventive, and come up with new ideas from your subconscious and your uh, through your own brain you need to fill it with stuff if you've only filled your mind with things you've seen you know you, you already know well if you love drawing spider-man all the time and that's all you draw then all you'll ever be able to draw is spider-man you will never be able to draw anything else other than spider-man and there's only so many ways you can draw spider-man because before it comes out well we, we've seen it all but if you draw spider-man in a batman suit because you've looked at Batman and you've given you you've already changed him. You've given him something different. You've turned him into something new. And then later down the line you might have Spider Bat and you've got a brand new character that's completely out there because you've filled your references from other things and you've mashed them together. It's like it's like taking two pieces of plasticine. Let's, let's use an example. You know, you've got a red plasticine and you've got a blue plasticine. You might make a blue house with the blue plasticine and might make a red car with the other plasticine. But if you stick them together, you've got a red car with a blue house back. <laughs> Do you, know what you, you mix them together, you make something new out of the two. Another good example, Lego. You know, Lego is one of it's quite popular these days with kids, kids and adults alike. There's, there's even channels, YouTube channels that dedicate themselves to Lego builds, where people mash, mix Lego with things that they are fans of. For example, I watched one today where the guy had made some um, aliens from the Aliens uh, movie series. You know, a chest burster and a pulse rifle, all out of Lego. Someone made a windmill. Um, someone made this big, massive spaceship, completely out of their own inventiveness. But they used different kits, but they mixed the kits together. So they had like a robot kit mixed in with a space kit, or a police kit, or a house kit. And they mixed them all together to come up with something completely new and different. Brand new, different, creative, whatever. You can't limit yourself saying, well I'll just use my... what." whatever I know to create things you have you have to have to have to always add things into your mind you've always got to always add to your repertoire in terms of the things you see and understand about different characters and different things you need to put information in your head that helps you to increase your capacity to come up with something new. You can't really be, use creative influences if you don't have things to reference from, if you know what I mean. You have to fill your mind with new things all the time. A good artist is always looking at something new. One of the big things I've been doing, to uh, we'll wrap up fairly soon, is I've been using a lot of magazines, and uh, particularly poses, to change and develop my pose styles with my characters. Up until now I've been just trying to work on just getting uh, my anatomy on point and getting all accurate and correct and all the rest of it. But now I'm trying to take it a bit stage further and coming up with different concepts. And I've used magazines. When I see a pose in a magazine, I think that's a really good pose, I can use that. I will then have that piece of that 
picture with me, when I do a piece of artwork, I look at one of those pictures that I've done, I think that pose would go well with this, and I create a new piece with the character in the pose that I've seen in the magazine. Because it's different, it's not what I would normally do. And I know down the road, and I've already seen it, that the next character I draw, I've already got that inspiration to add that pose in there to make that character stand out more. And you know, as people can, when I've shown people the picture and that, they've seen where the pose has come from, but they're inspired of what I've done with it and what, how it's how I've really been creative in terms of something new and innovative in terms of just coming up with my own ideas using a pose that's, that's been seen before and it does make a difference. Well, anyway, so we're coming up to the end of this video. Um, as you can hear, what I'm doing now is put some um, snow background on it and put a bit of shading just to bring him out. And in a moment, you will see the Elsa that I did um, prior to doing this guy. So I did Elsa first and I did him afterwards. And even in that, you'll see hopefully how, I can't remember if I did it in this video, but you'll hopefully see how I've even with those two standard characters and poses that people know, I've still tried to be a bit creative and inventive and um, what's the word I'm looking for here? And still give it a different piece. So the actual piece as a whole has not been done before. It's just the characters and the actual pose and shape of the characters is the same. Although I think I did try to change him a little bit but not massively so. Elsa was just a standard piece. But um, but you're seeing where, you know, the stage I was at at that time. And I was happy with it at the time, but I know that if I was to do Elsa again today, I'd do a much, much better job. So um, with that all said, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I don't think there's much more I can say. I've, I've gone on for a long time. Hopefully I've not bored you with all my waffle. Hopefully you have learned something from this video. If not, uh, do let me know and I'll try and make them more informative for later on but um, enjoy the final parts of this video thanks again for watching if you do like this and you want to see more of this kind of stuff especially if you want to see these longer um, uh, what's called it voiceover videos do let me know and I'll try and get more of these done um, but do give it a thumbs up like and share with anybody that you think that might enjoy this or might benefit from what you've learned what from the video today and I look forward to seeing you in the next one Oh, and one thing, don't forget, if you do want to be reminded of these videos, click the notification bell and set it to your specification, um, what that, whatever that might be. So if you want to make sure you are definitely notified when I'm live or uh, releasing a video, set it to the right settings so you always get, get um, a flag to say I'm live or whatever. But thanks again for watching. Have a lovely day, afternoon, evening, weekend, whatever day of time you're watching this. And until the next time, I will be seeing you. Bye-bye now.